Welcome to the Mike Don't Watch Podcast. I am your host, Mike Veerman, and I am here with my friend and trusty producer, Max Kerman. Max, you're back uh, after being away. It feels so good. <laughs> you don't understand. We've been going a little delirious on the road. Yeah, and we also got Shane Cunningham with us, our pop culture aficionado. Hey, man. And it's a Sunday, and we uh, all reunited for the first time last night. It's at, true. At well, the we're coming back from party. a big uh, nut party. Yeah. The nut threw a party last night. It was it was a glorious affair. Lots of food. It was also uh, Maxie's uh, birthday, so they brought her to, like a candy cake. Yeah. Well, I'll say, so my birthday is actually November 30, and the party was last night on December 3rd. But my actual birthday, before we get to the party, was spent um, in the UK. We, uh, we had a gig on the 29th in London. And at midnight, I went out with a friend uh, and we had a couple beers and I had a shawarma. It was a very like casual night. I was going to maybe celebrate the next night in Manchester where we were going to be playing on my actual birthday on the 30th. And then I proceeded to vomit for nine straight hours. Wait, did you actually party hard? Or? No, no, that's the thing. Not at all. I had like three beers and, you know, the, the band the next morning, I was like, in terrible shape and we had to drive from London to Manchester which was like six hours and I like literally didn't say a word I couldn't move my body and I think the band thought that I was just really hungover <laughs> and I was pretending to be like sick with the flu but I was actually very hungover and uh, you mean you were actually really sick so it was actually the very, truth comes out sorry, wow. <laughs> I was actually very sick and then we played in Manchester and we've only played there maybe once before. And um, the show, like, I thought we were going to have to cancel the show because I was so sick. Really? Would I, this be the first time you've ever canceled due to illness? If yeah, you had? first time ever. But I was like, okay, we'll, we'll try to make it work. And I showed up at the venue. I didn't sound check. I showed up mm -hmm. at the venue, like, 10 minutes before we played. I had a set list written out. But it became pretty apparent to me that any fast song that we have, I was going to throw up. Uh, so <laughs> all ballad show. It was a very <laughs> slow set. Honestly, it was, it was a very, like I was just like, and I told the crowd after like the fifth or sixth song, I kind of like showed my hand. I was like, guys, by the way, I'm like on my deathbed here and uh, I might faint if we play anything fast. Mm -hmm. So it's all ballads from now on. And the crowd kind of liked it. It was actually kind of a, an interesting show. You let them in on it. You I guys let were them in it together. You know what? I wasn't, after the show, my friend, who my Dave Kaufman, shout out, uh, he's a Montrealer who lived now, now lives in London, came up to the Manchester show. He, uh, he said, oh, if you didn't tell him, no one would have known, which is weird because in my head, I was like, everybody knows that I'm not really performing my best. Yeah. I, sh I should let them know that I, why I'm not. But it was funny. So there's this, girl named Lauren who's from Calgary uh, but she's on a semester abroad. She comes to all of our shows in Calgary and she's in Newcastle. She listens to the pod so shout out to Lauren. Oh nice. And she's she's very funny. She's like a, like a funny chick in the front row who like kind of mimics me as I'm singing but is kind of <laughs> making fun of me but she's like does it affectionately right. and she brought a friend of her who's also Canadian to the show in Manchester and her friend and I, she was her friend and keep in mind Lauren's probably like 19 years old or something like that so right. like young and excited and they're traveling and her friend would not shut the up through this whole show oh, in Manchester no. <laughs> and she was just like I'd be trying to talk and she'd be yelling random shit like during your stage band yeah or? during the stage like yeah during the show she'd be like Canada <laughs> or like I'd be I was trying to I, t I tell the story and never thought this would happen in that song and then she's just like and I never thought I was like shut up <laughs> and also it just made it worse too because I was so sick too and I and I usually when fans were acting obnoxiously I usually try not to give them like dagger eyes mm -hmm. but that night I couldn't help it but the funny thing is so she listens to the pod and she tweeted at the pod the next day she's like sorry Mike like Max literally talks about obnoxious Canadians at their international <laughs> shows <laughs> you did on the and last I'm episode and I'm sorry my friend did that so anyway her friend the next night they came to the oh, Glasgow double show. header double header and then and the friend the next night was very sober very well behaved and kind of knew that she'd been a bad girl so oh. but do you ever have like a like Comedians, I find they when they get a heckler, they have like a stock line, like, "Hey, like I work alone" or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a good line. <laughs> as an example of one, <laughs> that's actually a good line. <laughs> now you know uh, I don't, but I should actually. You know, I was thinking we we had a, the band had a conversation about this because inevitably there's a bunch of Canadians at these shows yelling shit like Oski Wee Wee over and over Sure, again. that's the Hamilton Thai Cats. Uh, yeah, or just yelling Hamilton or insisting on waving a fucking Canadian like flag they brought to the show. Sure. Just any of that stuff. So maybe we crowdsource this or you guys have it. Is there like a good line when somebody wants attention, someone who drunkenly wants attention, 
uh, for being Canadian mm-hmm. at an Arkell show, at an international Arkell show. What, what, it, what, do, what, what do you say to that? Like in a way that's like acknowledges them, but, but doesn't encourage them, doesn't encourage them. And also sort of subtly says, please shut the up. We've heard you. You could just do it that way. You'd be yeah. like, I see you there, but mm-hmm. that doesn't mean I want you to keep yeah. doing it. Yeah. Yeah. But even that, like, see, I even, th- do you feel I, like that seems like condescending or too condescending mean or just a little mean? And here's the other thing is that for us, we're tired of it because we get it every night. But for that person, they, they're probably so excited. It's a big night. It's a big mm-hmm. night. They're one of their favorite bands from Canada is like in their like international city and whatever, whatever. So it's like, I don't want to totally crush them, but I just want, <laughs> <laughs> I find it humor and you be direct about it. Yeah. Like you just like kind of Mike was saying, like, uh, just for example, yesterday while we were leaving nuts party, uh, Alex jumped on my back and gave me like a piggyback. Your wife? Yeah, my wife. So some people find that like very annoying. Like you're the couple trying to have like fun giving the wild piggyback. I go, look <laughs> at us. We're the fun couple giving each other piggybacks. <laughs> and then everyone laughed and it kind of acknowledged what some people don't like, but some people do yeah, like yeah. that. So if you're like, oh, look at us with the proud Canadians or something and you call them out in a teasing but fun way. Yeah. I find then they'll sh- up. Yeah, well, actually, so we do this bit in the crowd uh, at some of these sh- club shows where we go in the encore, we go out and we play one of our songs totally acoustically, like off the mic, like campfire style. And what I usually say is like, all right, everybody, we're going to try a social experiment here. We're going to see if we can get 400 drunk people to shut the up for three minutes. That's and that great. always gets a good laugh, but also sets the tone. That's so it's perfect. like, yeah, you say something like, you know, I know Canadians are, you know, are proud of our, you know, our humble nature. So please let's exhibit that or something. Yeah, like that. So prove like it. That. So yeah, prove, prove it. it. Yeah. Good. Do we solve it right here on the Michael Much podcast? Okay, so what is it? Canadians are proud. No, no, sorry. Canadians are, Canadians are known to be polite. So let's prove it. We'll talk after the set. There you go. That's good. Yeah. Well, it was, yeah, we were doing this, this bit. And Canadians got a lot of pride. So that's why you're being loud and I love it, but we're also very polite. So let's talk after the set. Yeah. Shut the f- up. Shut the f- up. I'll buy you a beer later. <laughs> yeah, yeah, shut the f- up. I'll buy you a beer later. That's good. That's good. Go. Okay. A Molson later. A, mol- there you a go. few Molsons. It's <laughs> funny. <laughs> You're very excited about that. <laughs> what um, else has been going on? So it, it was your birthday. Yeah, so, I have a question though about it because uh, I don't want to forget. Yeah. We were talking about it on Facebook Live, but you were too sick or hungover to <laughs> watch that. <laughs> sick, yeah. Like obviously, like your front man and band might be self conscious about saying your age, and I was wondering if you were that type or the type who's just like I don't care. Uh, good question because I'm 30 this year. Oh, um, it's a big one. Yeah. Uh, so you don't care. You just said it. Yeah. No, no. But you know what's funny. I, Going up to like thinking about 30 in my 20s, I was like, oh, I don't give a shit. And so, but then when it actually happened, I was like, hmm, I felt a little strange about it, but uh, I'm kind of over it now. It's, it's fine. Champagne birthday. Champagne, but yeah, th- th- uh, 30th on uh, November 30th. So. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, I got so many nice um, text messages from you guys. Thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, I didn't respond to Shane, and Shane was mad about it <laughs> for a few hours. Shocking. Like, it's a birthday or well, what? Who likes being ignored? <laughs> <laughs> like, Shane's such a baby. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I was, I was just like literally huddled over in a, in a van. Um, but <laughs> the, uh, with nothing but time to text back. <laughs> yeah. No, but I was just like, I couldn't do anything. I'm kidding. But, uh, the, uh, but yeah, I really felt, and normally I don't necessarily like, I don't like a big thing for my birthday. Like I, it's not, I don't expect like, I don't know. I think most dudes our age don't expect much, mm-hmm. but because uh, you don't like a lot of attention. <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, I do think I get so much attention anyway. I don't like, it's not like, oh, it's my birthday. You get your fill of attention get, on a regular on basis. On a regular basis. Yeah. It's like every show is like literally my birthday. So I, I appreciate that. But being, you know, in dreary UK, like at the end of like seven months of hard touring, straight touring, being away from my friends and family and being sick as a dog, I really, it was like, this sucks. This is like a shitty birthday and I never think that so uh that's why last night I was uh so happy to see everybody I was a little tired because we had just flown home that day and I still I'm still recovering from being sick but yeah the the, the birthday cake was the best it was all candy yeah so people, sparklers and shit were all attached to it it was like the club the VIP club when they bring the champagne bottles yeah. out the sparklers H- hilariously well we kind of walked in just as they were doing the candy cake so I got to walk in behind the candy cake as if I had been there the whole time and looked like I had something to do with it but I didn't <laughs> but my favorite part was so there were sparklers and then like candles with like little 30 thing 
and they were like, blow, blow them out, Max. And Max was trying to blow out the sparklers. And I was like, Max, you have to blow out the candles, not the sparklers. Sparklers. <laughs> like, you can't blow out yeah. sparklers. Yeah, because yeah. yeah, people, people were just standing there looking at me. I was like, what am I supposed to do? Yeah, that's always <laughs> weird, eh? When yeah, but I was like, oh, yeah, you blow out the candles. Um, did you eat any of the candy? Oh, yeah, I was eating a lot of candy last wow. night. And I'm going to go pick up the candy from the Nuts House after this. Oh, not, yo, Dan, are you going to sneak into the movie you're going to tonight? Oh, big time. What are you seeing? I'm going to see uh, the new Brad Pitt movie. Oh, Allied? Apparently yeah. that movie's amazing. Hey, I think you guys mentioned this on the pod, but I didn't know what it was at the time, but I watched it on the plane the whole way home. Quarry. Yeah. Have, yeah. You, guys, have you guys seen that? Yeah. Yeah. That, I was always teasing Mike. He was basing his look off that shit. That my hair was like the guy from Quarry <laughs> and growing the facial hair was... Well, what do you guys think of that? I, okay, I'm about six episodes. Of it. I don't know how many episodes there have been so far. Or I, it's over. It's over. There's, there's eight. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I really like style over substance and like cool atmospheric shows. So yeah. I really liked it. Yeah. What, what do you think? Uh, I liked it. I mean, it has a bunch of things that resonate with me, like the South, because it takes place in Memphis, mm -hmm. like 1960s, 70s kind of aesthetic and look that all suits me well. There's like a lot of music in it. Uh, there's like Southern accents that I like. Uh, <laughs> and you like sex scenes. Yeah, like there's that, a lot yeah. of nudity. A lot of graphic sex. <laughs> a lot of graphic sex. And also, d they don't do the thing in, that a lot of HBO shows do, where you get like a good sex scene like in the first episode and then they just stop doing it. You right. know, some not, maybe not HBO is a good well, example. Well, it's produced, Corey's produced by uh, Cinemax, it's called. Yeah. And the nickname for it in the States is Skinemax because basically they're known for having oh, so much nudity and sort of graphic sex in their shows. It's part of the draw. Yeah, so each episode there's like a, a pretty needless like graphic sex scene, I'd say. Yeah. Does the bump on the lead actor's head get distracting to you? Yeah, what is that about? Absolutely. I, yeah. I, what's weird is you cannot find any information about that lump online. <laughs> and it does he, he doesn't have it in another show. He does. It, like he oh, was, he does? He, that actor was on the OC. Yeah, that's right. He was Trey. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's hilarious. <laughs> um, but they, they just make up, they put makeup on his head. Oh, huh. that like actor. You can see the outline of it. Shane sure. did the deep dive on that actor. Yeah. Uh, Marshall Logan Green, uh, also known as Trey, if you're an OC fan, <laughs> but uh, he, do, he dated Marissa Tomei. And what? Yeah, I know. Before he like blew up and became uh, settle in for this. So he was dating Marissa Tomei. What's Marissa the age Tomei. Difference, though? It's like fifteen years. She's older. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Famously, okay. though, Marissa Tomei always has said she doesn't want to get married. She doesn't want kids. She doesn't want any of that. Then she meets this young stud, up and coming actor, kind of woos her, proposes to her. They have this kind of longer engagement. All of a sudden, it's just off. Like you don't know what. They're just broken up. Then, like five months later, You're the historian for this. Yeah, well, five months later, a kid pops out with another chick, and it, she's like normal age. <laughs> normal age. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he was engaged to Marissa Tomei, who never wanted to be engaged in the first place. But then she made an exception for this guy, and then, and then clearly, while they were together, he he knocked up a girl. Yeah. Wow. Just before uh, we get to the cast uh, and the creator of the Beaverton who are on the show today, I just wanted to ask one more question about your 30th birthday. Mm -hmm. Because it is a milestone birthday, people always have like, you know, goals and things that they want to accomplish by a certain point. Did you feel as you approached it, and maybe you don't even think about things this way, that you're like, this is where I wanted to be, or I'm slightly ahead or way ahead or slightly behind? I think I've been pretty, not, not, not to say that like anything, uh, like whatever in my professional life has been a breeze because it's not it hasn't been a breeze it's been kind of a brick by brick thing uh but i've but i've always felt very grateful that the fact that like we were able to go from university right into the band and like things started happening with the band at least in canada for a long time so i i still so i was on that level i'm like oh actually like i'm quite happy that like you know the band's have been my full-time job for the last five or six years and and i'm like i think counting your blessings is like a very good exercise. And, and I, and I try to do that as much as possible. So on that level, I feel, I feel really good about it. That said, um, yeah, the older you get, I think the more you're like, okay, I want to, I got to do shit, got to do shit, got to do shit. And, uh, so, but I don't think I necessarily needed a birthday to tell me that. So it wasn't, it didn't become like the existential like crisis that maybe it is for some people. Where do you see yourself in the big four Oh, Ooh, good question. You, you just like, I think, you want to make your life as easy, like as fun and as full and sort of in, in trying to get rid of like the hard, like bitch work stuff as, as much as possible. So if I can like just keep on doing like really fun stuff that's like fulfilling and that I think like is making the most of my talents or what I have to offer to the world, 
without having to to like do stuff I'm not good at and is like time consuming and like busy work, Mm -hmm. then, then I'll feel really good about it. Do you think you'll be a millionaire? Oh, (laughs) no, I've never thought about that. But that's not what he asked. Oh, well I would do. Okay. Good question. Would I think I'll be a millionaire? Like, like honestly, like like making a million dollars per year by the time you're 40. No, I don't think, no, definitely not. Shane, do you think you will be? No. Do you think you will be Mike? No. But you know, the thing about being, I'll tell you right now that the nut is listening to this. He's gonna be very disappointed that all three of us just said no to that question. But the thing about being a millionaire is that it's like, that's a lot of money, first of all, but it's about really wanting to be a millionaire. Like that, that being the goal. Mm -hmm. That's the great line. It's like, uh, it's really easy to make a lot of money. If all you want to do is make a lot is of money, make a lot of money. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, that means you don't have time for your friends or, or, doing or, fun you're, shit. or you're doing stuff that you don't even like. Yeah, exactly. It's like getting in shape. It's easy <laughs> if you just have no fun. Yeah. Yeah. Any, yeah. Anybody it's can a great do way to put it. Yeah, if you, yeah, exactly. Well, happy birthday, Max. Thank you. Thank you. Guys, today on the show, we have the cast and creator of the Beaverton, Luke Gordon Field, one of the creators of the Beaverton. And then we had the two anchors on the show, uh, Miguel Rivas and Emma Hunter. So that's a full house, man, for an interview. It was a full house. And you know what's interesting is so this interview took place the day after Trump was elected. This will be the last of these. I feel like the last three episodes have been the day after Trump was elected. So that morning, that Wednesday morning, I had Dragonette, which was a three person interview. And then I had to shoot up to the fourth floor where the Beaverton was doing a junk. And, and again, it was three people, creator and two cast members and like are you like hey could one of you guys sit out or are you fine with it <laughs> it crossed my mind but like anything when you get into the room like they sort of told me that it was going to be with the creator it ended up being good because he had some insight as you know the guy that started the satirical website for those who don't know the beaverton's sort of like a canadian version of the onion yeah. which max absolutely loves the onion i, love the I onion. feel like in our champagne boys message group max posts like an onion article at least once a week yeah it brings me a lot of joy <laughs> it really does. So the Beaverton is, is a Canadian version of that. And so got to talk to the guy who's one of the creators, um, who's also now like writing the show, uh, producing the show. And then the two cast members who were very sort of interesting in the sense that they're both actors. And well, you had your eye on the, the girl for quite a while, not I'm, like in a creepy way. Like, is it like this girl's got talent? Yeah, well, <laughs> actually. So, uh, for our listeners, Shane was in a documentary that's on Netflix, Canada called, uh, delivery. And the night that they shot all of their standard performances, basically the documentary was Shane and a bunch of other friends got up to do stand up for the first time to sort of challenge themselves and their expectations. Long story long, the night that they did their stand up, Emma Hunter, it was an open mic night, just jumped up and did her own open mic. They we're going back what, 3 years, something like that? Over 4 4 and a half, probably. 4 and a half years ago, and it was at the uh, the Yuck Yucks right on uh, Richmond, uh, in Toronto, downtown Toronto. And Emma got up and I didn't know who she was. I'd never seen her before. I'd never heard of her before. And I actually told her this when I, when I was interviewing her, I was like, you know, I actually saw you. Um, and she got up and she did a killer routine. I thought she was hilarious. She did like five impressions of like Victoria Beckham. And then like, uh, she had like a bunch of impressions. I can't remember them all now, but I remember thinking like this woman should audition for Saturday Night Live. She's like mm-hmm. very, very good. Do you remember it, watching her set? Well, yeah, she had a music thing too, where she kind of like did the lip sync thing before Jimmy Fallon popularized that. Yes. And it was like a dance routine. She was doing uh, funny dances. Like every time a song would come on, it was just like, I mean, amongst a bunch of amateurs and Shane, your set was pretty good. She stood out. Like she felt like a pro and she, it's funny when we I were brought drinking with her. Yeah. Absolutely. So then yeah. after we go to Jack Astor's to have some drinks as you do after a big thing like that. And she was sitting there with somebody and talking. And I remember we all were saying like, Hey, great job or whatever. And she was saying she reciprocated the thought. She did not remember any of this, by the way, when I brought it up, but of course not. Yeah. Now, I don't know if this would have been asked, but the, do you think there's a feeling amongst like people on the Beaverton that they're like, Oh, I I might be able to parlay this into a gig at the onion or, or like the daily show or one of these like American higher, like is it a stepping stone or like what did they talk about this sort of the other dichotomy there between Canada and America? That would have been a good question more so because of the the Yeah, (laughs) Thanks Max for that question. Now uh, two weeks later, he was drinking. (laughs) Um, yeah, you know, I mean, that is a good question, but I feel like a lot of the America Canada stuff, yeah, we t- Trump dominated the early part of the conversation because mm-hmm. it was such sort of a, a sort of um, landscape altering event yeah. that then we sort of more got into 
a little bit of that, not necessarily like, do you think being on the Beaverton can, you know, turn into you getting a shot on American television, but for these two actors, you know, there's not a ton of gigs in Canada. Right. Mm -hmm. And for them to get on a national television show on the comedy network, it's like, there was just like a real sense of joy and enthusiasm and relief. Cause it's like, you got to grind if you're an entertainer in Canada and to get a steady gig, you could tell they just both were very, very, very uh, grateful. Yeah. So anyway, uh, you guys want to, let's get to it. I didn't even finish what I was going to say there, Sorry. Max. <laughs> let's Without get to further it. ado, <laughs> let's get to the interview. All right, so how's everyone doing? You guys good? Pretty well, yeah. That's good. Everyone been asking about the election last night yes. on this junket. I mean, a little bit, we, yeah. But I mean, it makes sense. I mean, we're a political comedy show. <laughs> yeah. What an interesting turn of events to be doing press the day after. Was that by design? It was by design that we would air after the U.S. election. I don't think anyone anticipated what we would, we would be talking about. Right. I think most people were imagining that we'd be talking about, hey, there's the first ever female president. Or, hey, the apocalypse isn't happening. That's nice. So... <laughs> The fact that we're or there's not a cri- about there's those a things. crisis in divided America, yeah. but the bad people aren't in charge. Yeah. <laughs> For all three, when you're watching that, did you all watch the election last night? Yeah. I did. Yeah. So when you're watching it, obviously, <laughs> you're individuals and humans first that have to live in this world. But then you also have this job where you have the satirical news show. What's going through your head? Are you like, this is good for business, this is bad for business, because you almost can't make fun of it, it's too absurd. Or are you just thinking, this is bad for the world? I wasn't thinking, I was thinking about the world, for sure. I mean, today was coming, and Miguel, I like seeing my friend Miguel very much, and I was excited to see Luke for today, but I think it's, it's so big, it's so much bigger than what we are, that it just... I think we're all just in shock. And today's going to be a great day because it's the premiere of the Beaverton, but today is a weird day. <laughs> yeah. Sure. And I think we're all kind of feeling the same way. I'm just confused. Yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, I think I had like a little bit of a pit in my stomach and I'm thinking about debuting a comedy show the day after that. But I was talking about with these two earlier about when Jon Stewart kind of took off on The Daily Show was under George W. Bush's uh, reign, if you can call it that. And... I don't know, this can be an opportunity for satirical news to sort of become an important touch, an important touchstone for the public, and especially a worried public. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I was reacting, I'd like to think on a human level, but maybe a little bit more uh, crassly, I'll admit, I was thinking about the show as it was happening. <laughs> now, we were also live tweeting the whole thing through the Beaverton social media, so I was you never engaged. I was, I was engaged the whole time. I was never able to just watch. I was, you know, working on it the whole time. So that helped because it helped me uh, build up a callus to what was actually happening because I had to think about it not just on a personal level I had to actually treat it like work Um, so that helped me on an emotional level Uh, (laughs) but uh, yeah I think the you know the absurdity is tough to satirize with Donald Trump but I think now that he is in office there's so much he's not just a a clown anymore he's literally going to be the most powerful person alive and you know to use the old expression the leader of the free world so now all of a sudden that opens up a lot of doors for satire because you're not just making fun of a absurd caricature you're making fun of a man who literally has the nuclear codes an absurd caricature with power yes exactly so that that adds up a whole new element to our satire that makes it a lot more punching you know i keep thinking of that thing though how you can't you can't parody a parody. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I know that isn't exactly uh, apropos, but there's something that keeps running through my head about, you know, it's like, you know, you can't, if you parody Wayne's World, it's not, you know, it's yeah. already it's already Wayne's World. It exists. It's already funny. I I'm remember sure. in, in the... I'm just trying to talk about Wayne's World. I <laughs> <laughs> oh, love, love Wayne's World. such a classic <laughs> film. Ah, Chicago as Scarborough. Yeah. Scarborough as <laughs> Chicago. Uh, I, I, Aurora. Aurora, Aurora, right, Illinois. of course, Aurora, Illinois. Come on, name tags and hairnets, man. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> yeah, and Stan Makita's donuts is Tim Horton's donuts. Yeah. That's right, yeah. yeah. I, uh, I, I am still worried about how everyone's going to feel about stuff, but I do feel like it's it, it can become an exciting time. People are nervous now, but they won't always be nervous. Hopefully they'll become engaged, you know? Yeah, passionate. I, I remember during the Rob Ford era after he won, which, you know, that was another scenario where I think... Uh, left-leaning people were like, well, he doesn't have a chance and just overlooked how powerful uh, his his hold was. 
And I remember during his his reign, I keep calling it a reign. Maybe I should say something. <laughs> else, oh, you're not that, wrong. that everyone was like, if, I, I was thinking, if they make a movie about this, as they make a movie about everything one day, whoever portrays Rob Ford, everyone's going to be like, that's too ridiculous. That's it's so ridiculous. Yeah, like the stranger than fiction. Because it, it, the yeah. reality was too weird. And I mean, Donald Trump is the president. There's nothing weirder than that. I don't know how to make that uh, uh, more absurd. So you have to come at it in creative angles, you know? Yeah, 100%. I mean, you just have to, I think you have to look at it from the big picture of what this means for America. Because even if Donald Trump, as Emma's saying, is a, such a parody of himself already, yeah. the, the fact that enough people, 60 million, I think, voted for him, uh, means that there's, you know, something wrong, to, you know, to be to, to give a glib response, but like something wrong in America right now that he's able to be catapulted into the highest office in the land. So I think that opens up a lot of questions and by extension opens up a lot of doors to, for discussion and for comedy. So it's it's no longer just about one person. It's about society as a whole and American society specifically, but the world at large. I mean, all over the world, things are going a little bit haywire. If you look at Brexit, if you look at you know the 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 rise of the far right movements in Europe were kind of you know the last bastion of uh, what used to be a pretty standard social dem- democracy. Uh, that it's kind of odd because we're we're you know certainly a lot of our show is making fun of Canada, but also we look outward into the world because Canadians I think as a people we often look outward, and I think there's an interesting perspective where we're kind of sitting there going like, I think you know, we're kind of like the last person of the party and everyone around us has gone nuts and we're the last sober one a little bit. Mm. There's also, okay, and this is the last thing I promised about Trump, but there's that. There's also something insanely not funny but a bit funny about the idea of a society watching the debates that I watched and going like, I know who I'm voting for. <laughs> and then voting for the guy. Like, watching what I watched and seeing, like, just, I mean, I mean, that was comedy. It was that what was going on, and that a collective group of people were like, "This has definitely confirmed what I already know, which is Trump should be president." It is <laughs> amazing to me. I mean, it's um, it's truly in the great, in the genuine sense of the word, amazing. I'm amazed. I, I'm just glad that we've opened the door to the real reality of a Will Smith Kanye West ticket in 2020. <laughs> that would do well. Doesn't doesn't matter who's president, vice president. I was going to say, but how do you possibly the choose who's yeah. president? I, I feel like naturally you make Kanye West the vice president because you, you, as vice president you can really go nuts. True. And I think Will Smith, Will Smith has more broad lens, appeal as well. That's true. He can get into middle America. <laughs> under this new celeb politician lens, I yeah, think Will Smith would be all right. His weird you know son, his weird better son than... can float around. <laughs> yeah, Jane. That's a strange son who's like, Man. don't go to school. Yeah, they're, <laughs> yeah. Son. Maybe they're right. What makes sense anymore, Emma? I, yeah, don't, even know. I don't know. I don't know what's going on. They seem woke, it's those kids. Down. Well, Will Smith down. knew more when he planned out how to become a movie star. He accurately predicted the American people far better than the polls did. So right? He right. knows what he's doing better than, you know, 538 and everyone else. Yeah. President Fresh Prince, please. <laughs> when, uh, so In Pennsylvania. The Beaverton yes. makes the jump to TV. Mm-hmm. How does that come about? So it came about in kind of a very fun but odd way in that uh, we were just kind of building our brand online and and, uh, writing funny articles and and just kind of really trying to get our name out there. And uh, we had a couple articles go kind of viral. um, And a TV writer uh, by the name of Jeff Desky uh, started seeing our articles pop up on all his feeds and everything. And he emailed me about uh, uh, starting a, trying to think about ways to adapt the TV show. And I've told him this before, which is that I don't know how he found my specific email, because we always just use staff at thebeaverton.com, general email. And he found some kind of obscure email that I didn't even know had been set up for me, uh, luke at thebeaverton.com. I don't know how he found it. It's the one and only email I ever got on that email. It doesn't exist anymore. The only email I ever got was Jeff asking me if I'd ever thought about turning the Beaverton into a TV show, uh, which worked out pretty good. Uh, and we met up and just you know, had a couple uh, beers, saw if we got along. Uh, we got along great, and we had very similar outlooks on the world and comedy and everything like that, and really had similar ideas for how we would make this the jump into a show. Uh, and then we just started putting together, uh, you know, our kind of idea of a writing room, came up with like a pitch document, took it around to producers, and then uh, Pier 21, who's the producer of the show, jumped on board, and then we came over to Bell, and they were on board almost immediately. It was. Uh, my first experience pitching a TV show, so I'm not the best sample audience, but from what everyone 
has told me it's we've had a very charmed process. It doesn't normally go as quickly as it's it did. It's been a smooth run. It's been a smooth run. I mean, don't get me wrong. It's been a lot of work. Uh, and uh, it's been, you know, there's obviously been uh, hardships along the way. But from all accounts, the fact that we're, we've gone from pitching to where we are with premiere date as fast and smoothly as we have has been super lucky on our part, which is great. In a process like that where you're working with a huge company yeah. like Bell Media or Comedy Network, is there any trepidation for you as a creative or a comedy writer where you go, oh, you know, am I losing a bit of what we do over here on our little website? And like, am I going to be able to explore all the avenues I want to? Or are you just like, shit, this is awesome. We got a huge opportunity. Let's take it at all. I did have that, that trepidation until we met with uh, Bill and Sarah from Comedy Network, bec- uh, who are our first points of contact there, uh, because they so immediately got it. And they so immediately made it clear that they wanted the voice of the show, sorry, the voice of the website to carry over to the show. Uh, and they have at no point ever suggested we water things down or tone it down or not go as as hard as we would online. They have 100% been in favor of doing the biting, the darker, the edgier comedy. Uh, and everyone at, at Bell Media and Comedy Network has been absolutely the same. So while I absolutely had that concern uh, and just kind of assumed that that would be a fight as we went forward, it has literally never come up. They've always been on board with the edgier material as long as it's done well and is funny and and has the right target uh, in its sights. And uh, as a fan of the website before the show ever even happened, an exciting development for me is that the website's just going to keep going and yeah. keep growing. And so it it's not, side by yeah, side. it's not oh, like sure. they had to sort of retire one to do the other, which may be a thing if you make sort of, you know, a demo for a TV show and then you move into TV show, you don't do the demos anymore. Sure. But the website is its own entity that's going on today right now. So, yeah, yeah it's going to keep going. So you get the show. How do Miguel and Emma become involved? Uh, well, we uh, and when I say we two wishes on a monkey's paw. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Jeff and I had been uh, huge fans of both of them, independently. Um, I had uh, seen Emma and Miguel perform comedy around town no, numerous times. was huge fans of both of them. Were you um, aware of Luke? I don't know who Luke is. Yeah. Luke? Yeah. Luke is this guy, right? <laughs> <laughs> I know. No, I take I, back. I, we were, I'm going to take back everything I just yeah. said. I was aware of the Beaverton, for sure. I thought it was this really brilliant thing. And, and most of the guys on the Beaverton come from sort of other avenues in life. Like, they're all sort of comedy-focused, but have had other jobs. And... Um, have explored sort of diff- so they're they're the sort of amalgamation of a number of different types of minds who all sort of beautifully create the beast that is the Beaverton. So I was yeah, it, it was a very exciting thing. I think for a lot of people sort of in the comedy community, like what is this? Thing? Who are where are who are? It was just a huge huge sort of voice that started to appear, and then all of a sudden became I think very important. Uh, the and the live con- uh, comedy community in Canada and Toronto where we all live is enormous uh, and it's sprawling, and but also there's. There's a connectivity as well, and so I'd, I'd heard of Luke around, but I hadn't actually met him until we started yeah. the show process. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, so they, so they I mean, we, 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 we did auditions, but they were always kind of our two at the top of our list. Um, and it was, you know, we, the audition process was very different from, I think, other shows in that we didn't have, like, characters in mind and we need you to come in and match these characters. We wanted to build the shows around our performers. Um, and Which is we, so great. What a <laughs> gift. Yeah. Well, I mean, it just happens. makes sense because, you know, we wanted to use, as Emma said, the, the comedy community in Toronto and, and Canada at large is amazing and, and doesn't have a lot of TV exposure currently. Um, so we knew we wanted to draw on that, on that resource, on that well. Uh, so it only made sense to, you know, use people's uh, own names and use people's own personas, but heighten them the way they do on, say, The Daily Show. Uh, and, and, and write to the people we work with. I mean, you know, we would never want to shoehorn in Evan Miguel into a role that doesn't play to their strengths when their strengths are, are so amazing as performers. So we really worked with them to build the characters as we went along the development process, filming the pilot and then filming the, you know, the 13 episodes. So it was really kind of like a back and forth about, uh, you know, when when Em and Miguel first read together, we'd seen them read independently, and they first read together, it was kind of like that, that lightning strike moment where you're like, okay, this is the show. It's their dynamic, it's their back and forth, uh, and you know we're gonna do a lot with that, and it's gonna go into other places, but the home base of the show is Em and Miguel at the desk, and the dynamic these two so naturally fall into when they play each other, and where they are as performers. Getting to you guys and sort of your background as performers, uh, 
then I'll start with you, Emma. Sure. I actually saw you a few years ago at Yuck Yucks. I think it was an open mic night. Oh, God. <laughs> and some friends of mine were shooting. They were doing, like, stand-up for the first time, and they made, sure. like, a documentary about it. They filmed a documentary of themselves doing stand-up for the first time. Yes. Bold move. It's on Bold Netflix, guys. actually, though. Anyway, Bold so... Move. Put yeah. their names online. You randomly happened to go up that night. You were fantastic. Oh, well, that's great. And then after, uh, we were all going for drinks at Jack Astor's because they felt triumphant, and you actually happened to be sitting, and I was like, <laughs> hey, you were really good, and oh. you were so gracious. Oh. Anyway, don't worry, we'll get to you too, Miguel. She said, get away with me so quietly. <laughs> get away from me. Um, yeah, so anyway, what, what's your lineage? What's your history? How did you get yeah, into comedy? I'm so happy you saw that because those stand-up days are so hot on my heels and are so something I, I'm very nervous about and still am nervous when I do it. So it's so great that you were that. I feel like we know each other now, and especially yucks. It's, you know, it can be a tough room. Um, and, uh, and I would always go up there and they were, they were very good to me there, but it was always a night where I'd go, okay, like, let's, here we go. Um, so yeah, so that's interesting. And I've, I have bombed at Yuck Yucks so many times, so I'm glad you were there. Everyone, everyone oh, has. We all have, right? So I'm glad you were there on a good night. Um, yeah, but I, so I study theater at Queens, um, and I was sort of classically trained, and I did actually, um, I worked with a Shakespeare Repertory Festival for my first three years in the business from 21 until about 24, um, and it was a really, really, I think maybe the most important thing for me as a performer, because uh, I was very fortunate I got to play Juliet and Isabella and Measure for Measure, um, and the amount of sort of text work that you have to do, and there's moments in Shakespeare that are so funny, so sort of trying to connect with audiences through this text that can be pretty tangly for, um, for your average, you know, dude. Um, try to connect, connect with people through that really sort of allowed an outlet for me to to figure out you know okay how what's an alternative to this because it's really hard um, and so then I started doing sketch comedy um, with some girlfriends from Queens was that a natural shift or was it just your friends were doing it I was so just you're like, dead I can do broke it. man like there was this, <laughs> like, there was this idea that people have an a uh, 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 a plan for their careers and most of the time we just throw shit at every wall and cross our fingers and just like bulldoze our way through it's like what it is to be in your 20s and a performer so I was just doing that I was doing stand up sketch I was trying to do cheese commercials like whatever I love you know? that you said you were broke so you got into sketch, sketch comedy <laughs> <laughs> so no, no. no but you know You'll what do I mean anything. I, sure, sure, I will sure. do anything like yeah. I will try every single thing I'll wear the panda costume like what do you want me to do <laughs> whatever so and so what happened is you sort of ride the wave you know and I sort of rode this the sketch comedy stuff and the comedy stuff started to sort of take off so you just follow it and and um and yeah so that um that kind of became more of my focus and it just felt right you know how you'll sort of try different things as a young person you go like oh no this like this suits me man so so that was um, sort of how that happened and then that you know I was still broke for most of my life so, uh, <laughs> so so this something like this is just I mean you, you couldn't imagine for a greater gig and to and to just bear with me for a second but to mm -hmm. share it with Miguel a guy who was so talented and so so deeply kind to be at a desk with somebody like that because we we're at the desk we're there for like 12 hours yeah. and we just talk all day and he is so funny he's such a giving performer he's so naturally talented and and um, i just feel very lucky to be doing this with him yeah now you're gonna have and to reciprocate he's, some he's of that he's gonna throw up yeah. he, he's like lost his bagel there emma's really rotten and i worked around <laughs> um, she lies she lies she lies no yeah it was such a wonderful experience doing this with emma i've known her for at least 10 Tell years, I'd say. Tell your story. Yeah. Yeah, get, get to the beginning. All right, here's yeah. my what, thing. What you do? I was yeah. born at St. Michael's Hospital in Toronto, Ontario. Oh. And, no, okay. We don't um, have to go that far. No, mm -hmm. okay. Uh, I went to U of T like and, and Sheridan College uh, in Mississauga in Oakville, which was like a bizarre, kind of weird experience. I think specifically of an album called Mississauga Goddamn by the Hidden Cameras. Very accurate title. Um, and Pure so, reference, but sure. yeah, it was a popular, popular ish album in the early 2000s, but it was just mm -hmm. about how tough Mississauga is to be in. But while I was there, I met so many people that I still work with to this day in comedy uh, and maybe being isolated kind of focused us a little bit. I, I, too, was going there to be a very serious actor, which I always imagined myself as a, as a young man. Um, and I did classical plays and all those things. And, and my younger brother, Freddie Rivas, who's so funny, a great Toronto comedian, he was already on the path. I'm going to be a comedian. I'm going to be so funny. And when I graduated, you know, you want to be this theater actor, this film actor, you realize that there are just not that many gigs. Yeah. There's just not a lot of gigs. Even if you're going to do independent theater all the time, there, there's maybe more now, 
but back then there was nothing. There, you would go months at a time without doing anything. However, the comedy community, which my brother Freddie was entrenched in, had this opportunity where you could go on stage every night if you want. Every night you want to go on stage, no problem. Like multiple times. And that, as a young actor, is so addictive. So you're not necessarily doing Shakespearean monologues, but you're going out in front of people and trying to sell an idea, trying to tell a story, trying to be a character, trying to just be in front of people. And so that was kind of how I got... I was always into comedy, obviously, but that sort of pulled me away from chasing, I guess, like a theater career into doing live comedy all the time. And fa fast forward 10 years, and you're like, oh my God, I've been doing comedy three, four times a week for 10, 11 years straight. Good Lord, who am I? Um, so to have an opportunity like the Beaverton come along and sort of be a, a graduation to finally go on television in a, in a substantial way, it's really, it feels really nice, you know? It feels very, feels very natural after such a long time. For both of you, you know, you being in theater, wanting to be actors, and then going into stand-up or sketch, like you said, what was it like to, to start writing your own material? Was that a challenge? Where it's yeah. like, not only so can I just get up and be on a stage and perform, which is what I really love, but now I gotta write my own shit. And yeah. There's this great book called Poking Dead Frog by Mike Sachs. And, it's, an it, and it interviews many great comedic writers. And I honestly forget who said it in the book because there's so many people interviewed. But they said, whoever says that they have fun writing or that writing's easy is, easy is a total liar. Uh, the product of writing is so fun, so invigorating. That's why people do it, so they can get their voice out there. But the actual fashioning of material and writing is is a, it should be super challenging. You're always trying to push yourself. That's the beginning phase of any kind of art is conceptualizing it. And yeah, I think even after 11 years, you're like, okay, I have a bit more of a method, but good lord, I haven't figured it out. Yeah, no, and I think for me, not. it, I, you know, I would get you get so many scripts when you're auditioning for stuff that you go, this is a piece of junk. Who wrote this crap? And then all of a sudden you're sort of, you're, you're sitting at your computer going like, oh, I don't know, I mean, this is hard. I, guess, <laughs> I, guess I have no ideas. He walks in and says, how are you doing? Get some I don't ideas, know. you know? So it's, it, for me it was definitely a challenge, but I, I found personally that the more, and I need to be better, but the more you do it, the better you get. It's like anything. Absolutely. So the second the thing says, the first, I mean, the first time I did stand up, I mean, talk about toilet water. It was long and shitty, like just, 15 like minutes of like <laughs> just bad um, and then the, you know you just get better you get better and characters become clearer and you realize unless it's fast and funny probably people are going to zone out or just get drunk it's it's really interesting for me because we're on TV saying our own names now you know which I think is a is a sort of a gift as well in terms of notoriety we're going to get to go on TV once a week and say our names multiple times well that's fascinating too though because I mean are you playing yourselves? You're playing like sort of a satirized version of yourselves, yet you are saying both of your own names. It, I mean, how do you sort of contextualize that? I, th I think it's are you a protective? little. Protective. It's a little bit in the Colbert region, I think, where Stephen Colbert, the character on the original Colbert Report, is not what he's like. It's an exaggeration, and I think there's elements of truth to everything, which is why it might seem natural to the people who cast the show. But absolutely, it's all an exaggeration. It's completely ridiculous. Yeah, we're actually we're actually quite dissimilar from the characters that we play. Like Miguel is very very straight laced, sort of an A type, um, OCD type, and I'm this sort of flagrant narcissist, sort of sex hungry, smart, definitely smart. But uh, yeah, they're they're sort of they're they're hyper hyper caricatures. Um, of I guess parts of us that exist. In real life, I'm a us. mess. I'm a mess. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. And in real life, I'm not aware of Emma having any outstanding warrants the way she does on the show. Yeah. So, like gotcha. we're always referencing like a parole officer. This, yeah. Like the two guys I'm you know sleeping with, etc. So uh, yeah. So they're not exactly. Uh, but but I know what you mean when we protect him, and I think because we we have spent our lives on stages playing other people. For me, I'm not I'm not worried at all about somebody confusing what I'm saying with what I think on the show like like I can't believe you know she loves Donald Trump like I just I don't think it'll come across I don't think it'll seem like we're I think people are smart and yes, I think viewers I think are, smart, are smart and they're going to watch right. this show and you know satirical news is not a brand new thing as a as a existing format people are aware of rhythms and especially aware of actual news rhythms and Luke can speak to this more maybe but I feel like the show is not only satirizing with its content but also with its form and the the presentation of the show with us at the desk is is heightened and comedic and, and satirical immediately as soon as you start watching it we're, we're making fun of making fun with uh, uh, real news broadcasts and so I think when people see it they're not going to be like I bet that guy's exactly like that they maybe won't know exactly what I'm really like but they'll see that Miguel Rivas on TV and say 
well, this is meant to make me laugh, I think, not to be a real exploration of who he is. You're giving the audience the, uh, the benefit of the doubt. Yes, yeah, absolutely. I think we're also both just so excited to have a job. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's um, almost there. Lastly, this is for all of you, comedically speaking, what are the differences between, you know, covering Canadian politics and American politics? I, that's a really good question. I think the, you know, the main difference is our politics doesn't tend to get as crazy as theirs, obviously. I mean, even before this whole Trump thing, American politics is, is the politics of extremes. It's it's wild swings. It's dramatic it's volatile. Moments. It's, yeah, it's, it's CNN breaking news. And Canadian politics has a lot more of the... Uh, you know, things get interesting and, and dramatic, but it sort of stays within certain boundaries of what we'd expect. But at the same time, there's a enjoyability to that and a satirical element to that, which is because the, the to use Miguel's point, because the format of our politics doesn't get so dramatic, I think sometimes we forget about the content of it a little bit. That we, like, you know, with Justin Trudeau, because he's you know, being portrayed as this like lovely, wonderful antidote to all the ills of the world, and he's this progressive person, and and is going to you know lead Canada into this you know uh, progressive future. You know, we kind of forget like there's a lot of stuff he's doing that I think a lot of people aren't talking about, and there's a lot of problems to Justin Trudeau putting up this kind of like shiny, happy face on the Canadian map. Uh, because there's a lot of stuff that he's able to hide behind that and that he's doing that are very similar to what the previous government did. So we kind of have a lot of fun on the show with satirizing Canadian smugness on looking down on Americans while completely ignoring our own, you know, picadillos and our own skeletons in our closet. So that's a big thing that we really go after on the show is is that kind of idea of Canadians thinking, oh, well, it's better than an American. That doesn't mean it's good. Yeah. Like that just means it's, you know, better than the worst potentially. But details are so stressful. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so we have a we, you know, we have a lot of fun with that angle of it, and we have a lot of fun with, uh, you know, this kind of constant everlasting search for a Canadian identity that our country seems to be on, which uh, for better or worse America has settled on its identity, which I don't necessarily think it's a good identity, but oh, I they, hope you're they, wrong. Seem, they seem very confident in it. Whereas the Canadians are kind of idea of what a Canadian uh, the Canadian identity is changes every five to ten years. Yeah. Uh, and I think what's really nice now is we've entered in this period where Canadians are not so worried about their country. There's a self confidence to our country now. And I think yeah. there's a self confidence to our comedy writing and comedy performance from these two and the rest of the cast. Uh, that that reflects that and the, and the recent change in, in kind of you know Canadian perception about our own country. And uh, I think uh, that we owe a lot of that to Drake. <laughs> oh, no. I knew you were going to bring no, it up. Miguel, I knew you were going to do this. No. Every interview. There, there, are, there, are, like some, there are some. There are some things that aren't similar, oh. and there's some things that are super similar oh. to my character and my real life thing. And one is that I just love Drake. Love Drake. And, and uh, I think he. Uh, He's done a lot for Toronto globally. Don't yeah, yes. globally. Don't and I think, that, I think that extends don't to Canada. I don't back me up here. Fire, but I might be with back Miguel me up on here. His self confidence. We're getting it by osmosis. The rest of us Canadians were like, "Yeah, I'm like this guy." He's like, my neighbor, that's me, I'm him, let's do it. So, shout out to Drake. <laughs> Six God. Yeah, we literally, I remember after, you know, we were talking about having, getting together and talking about these characters or whatever, and I distinctly remember after the first time we all had a chance to sit down and like grab a beer or whatever and just talk about your character slash your, the heightened version of yourself on the show, was we just went back to our little writer's room and just wrote on a note card, Miguel loves Drake. We just put it on the wall. <laughs> He's not like, even my favorite rapper. I just, I just like him a He's lot. He's the one you talk about the most. Yes. But if I talk about MF Doom all the time, everyone will get scared. Yeah, that's fair. Thanks so much for your time, guys. <laughs> <laughs>
talk to Frank and, and just Mike, how could you, for people who haven't listened to a past episode, how do you describe Frank in a concise way? I, uh, Frank is like a, a millionaire, possibly billionaire, like an apple juice dude that loves making films, starring his own films. He has like six features that he pays like Oscar nominated actors to come in. People like James Caan, Martin Landau, uh, and he makes these films and he has a late night TV show and Shane is absolutely obsessed with this guy and how he basically- How old is he? He is 55. Okay. And so is Ashley Poppin. She messaged me. She's 55? <laughs> <laughs> no, of course not, Mike. She's uh, obsessed with him as She well. became yeah. obsessed with Frank D'Angelo. Your, uh, what's that? Manager. Your manager. Yeah. Uh, Max's manager is obsessed with Frank D'Angelo. And she's even gone to a, a taping of his show. <laughs> okay, so awesome. I got sucked into uh, the Vortex. And after I saw, I went to his movie premiere. And after it, he had kind of like, uh, on the way out, there's cameras filming you. And you're kind of like funneled into a lineup where you have to kind of meet and greet Frank. Because at the premiere. Yeah, okay. he sets it up. It's like perfect. So I'm like, oh, I'm even if I wanted to avoid Frank, I couldn't. But then when I go to like talk to him, Alex has already got it, her arm around him. My wife has already <laughs> like accosted Frank and has her arm around him. And Daniel Baldwin, who's also in the movie, is there and he's filming it all. So I'm like, oh. Like, I got to film this because it's so unbelievable. Like Alec Baldwin's brother is just filming my wife getting her picture taken with this guy I'm obsessed with. <laughs> so I just film the experience. And uh, Frank's like, come on, take the picture. But I'm like, uh oh, I'm filming it. So I just <laughs> pretend I'm taking a photo. I'm like, click. And I'm like, all right, good photo. He's like, all right. And then he just kind of moves along. And I'm like, oh, I've ruined my chance to talk to Frank because my whole goal going there what beyond one watching this fascinating experience of a movie was talk to Frank, get him on the show and let's pick his brain. Yeah. I'm like that, ex that that's gone. So I'm like, okay, I'll just email him when I get to work. Like I, I learned this technique when I was doing the delivery documentary that we talked about in the first half, which is you make the subject heading much music interview <laughs> and it gets people's attention. You know, your show is called Mike on much. Yeah. So I said much music interview. I gave, I gave, said, Hey Frank, big fan of all your films. I'm fascinated not only by the content of your films, but the fact that you did five films in the last three years, we'd love to pick your brain about your, your process. And then, uh, I get a response that just says, call me. <laughs> and so I'm like, oh man, I'm so nervous. I'm you like, got his number now. I'm pacing, I'm sweating. And then I uh, call him and like, you know, when someone's really important, they have like zero time for you to like waste. Oh uh, yeah. So, no, no time for pleasantries yeah. or anything. So the phone rings, goes, hello, hello, hello. And I, I haven't even said hi yet. I'm like, hi, hi Frank. I'm uh, Shane from Much Music. He's like, all right, all right. I got to get rid of this guy. Hold on one sec. Clicks over comes back a second later he's like man he's like the way you guys stay relevant i don't know how you do it it's incredible i love much music uh, <laughs> he's like it's it's incredible i really respect you guys i'm like oh frank uh but it's it's not a tv interview it's it's a it's a podcast we're gonna he's like all right whatever when you want to do it next week it's like let's do this <laughs> and i'm like no like because in the email i said it had to be between december uh 3rd and 6th or something He's like, oh, okay, let's do it next Tuesday. I was like, no. He's like, okay, you tell me. When are we doing this? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, okay, okay uh, how about between these dates? He's like, okay, Tuesday, 1130. He's like, you like wine? I was like, I was like, yeah. He's like, I'm going to open a $700 bottle, dollar, $700 bottle of wine for you. It's like best wine you ever had in your life. You eat? I'm like, I eat. It's <laughs> like, I'm going to give you the best meal you've ever had in your life. I'm like, all right. I'm like, this sounds awesome. Like I'm taking the day off work to have this experience. Because normally people come too much. And yeah. my plan was to tell him to come to us. But he was so like charming and aggressive and like, you know, it's a mix of like hospitality and rudeness that like really threw me <laughs> off, off guard. So I just agreed to all of his things. Didn't talk to you about it because I thought, you know, we would talk about it on, <laughs> on, on So air. it's like two days from now? It's on Tuesday at 1130 in Mississauga at his restaurant <laughs> called Mama D's. <laughs> <laughs> what? Yeah, I know. But I want to like, I don't know. Like, I'm going to take the day off work or something. I want to like film it. And I, I honestly, because um, we did the documentary delivery. I kind of want to like, after the pot, ask him if I can hang around on his, the set of his next film and film the process. Like, you totally should. Yeah. And I've read his, uh, 
His biography, like <laughs> Shane, literally just pulled out. It's called Being Frank. Oh, that's what he looks like. The inspiring story of Frank D'Angelo by Frank D'Angelo. <laughs> <laughs> of course, his story's crazy, man. Really? You read yeah. this front to back? Well, I'm I'm halfway through. Right. But it's, it, I'm going to have read it by the time Tuesday. So comes you're going to have to produce the interview for Mike. Well, uh, I, because would, you you know, or, or do you want to do the interview? Well, Mike and I are going to do it Mike, together. Mike suggested this. I'm not trying to take over the pod, but if there ever was one to take over, it'd be this. This one. might be the one. Yeah. Do you do you want to fly solo? Well, w- no. Like I want to do it with you because I find you'll yeah. you know make it seem professional. <laughs> 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 the whole time, no, here's drinking what, wine. Here's the, <laughs> <laughs> it's a seven hundred dollar bottle. Uh, I will go. I'll like keep it on track. We'll like like I'll sort of like, but I want you to interject mm-hmm. because obviously you find him fascinating. Like let's sort of like me and you jump in the way that like Max would jump in when he yeah. was sitting for interviews, whether it was Frank Turner. Or I love because yeah, I've seen all of his movies. All so do I have to prep the questions, or are you just going to prep the questions? Should I do homework for this? Well, Max, we don't have time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, well, you might have a good take on this, or you just, yeah, if. if Research, it's easy. If you just do a Google search, like... Okay, you know, I'll do some work. Yeah. yeah, hit us with like five to yeah. eight questions. Yeah. And then you'll know some... St- and then maybe you come up with like three or four areas you want to go to. And then the three of us will get on an email. We'll put it together and we will talk to Frank D'Angelo. Let me see if I can come to this. I don't think I can. Because even as a songwriter, Max, he's written like 3,000 songs. I forgot that. He is a musician. <laughs> yeah. yeah. In his movies, all the songs that oh, are yeah, like, He does yeah. all the, the soundtrack. Yeah, he's got uh, a good voice. Man, okay. Where did the thing go? I'm just like I'm just looking at my. It's so it's this Tuesday at 11:30 yeah, in Mississauga. Mama D's in Mississauga. Okay, cool. Yeah, I think I think we're tied up in Toronto, but um, and I want to see if we can get your brother yeah, okay. to f- shoot it. Yeah. And can can we use like you know how normally we don't use mics? Yeah. Frank's like super comfortable like using a mic. Can we use mics? We, we can bring so this setup. Yeah, he'll love it. Okay. Great. This, this is going right. to be awesome. This is going to happen. All right. Well, there's a teaser for, for the a next. A few episodes away. Yeah. We got Kirk Hammett, which we didn't even talk about. Oh, my God. We'll and save then, that for the next uh, one. Save the next one. And then we got, uh, or actually before Kirk, we have the Jingle Ball. Yeah. yeah. Well, the yeah. next dessert we can describe with the experience. Of At the this. Jingle Ball. Uh, of this uh, Frank thing. Oh, yeah. This has become the Frank podcast. Yeah. And now Shane is I really love pushing. It. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. That's all. That is our episode. Uh, Please uh, listen and subscribe to the show. Leave us a comment on iTunes. It makes a big difference. Tell your friends. We love doing this stuff. Uh, And the more people that know about it, the better. Mike and Watch Podcast is produced by Max Kerman. And I'm your host, Mike Veerman. See you next week if we don't die on the weekend.